But what I find disingenuous about the government's arguments are that the government is kind of seems to be operating under this idea of, well, we can just kind of pass these copyright laws for the general welfare, you know, kind of a general welfare of the US. Um, we don't have to tie the interests to the kind of interests that are served by the copyright clause, uh, and that's fine and dandy. I, I think there's an argument that can be made that says, once you start passing copyright laws, um, you have to go back to the copyright clause, and you have to be limited by the copyright clause, not just in the way of limited times, uh, but also uh, it, it, by the preamble of the clause, which says you need to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Uh, and since I think it's pretty unarguable the URAA doesn't promote creation of works or even greater dissemination than occurs, you could say the URA retards rather than promotes the progress, and therefore uh, you, you can't escape the kind of progress clause analysis. Once you start doing copyright law, you have to comply with the, the, the limits of the progress clause. Um, there is clearly a, gov a legitimate interest in complying with treaties. That I don't think it, that that's going to be very hard to argue against. And here the nuance is that Byrne requires some measure of retroactivity. You can't have no retroactivity and comply with 18. The government interest in complying with treaties cannot trump, uh, for example, the First Amendment. There, it, there, there were much better tailored ways of implementing. Protection that US authors will get in other countries is independent of how we apply 18. 18 does not say this is a recipro reciprocal basis type of agreement. The political argument, the uh, underlying political argument, which is, well, other countries will look at what we do and decide what they do based on what we do. There is zero precedent to argue that. I've never, I've not seen it anywhere. The only part of the argument that you can rely on if you're the government without um, making a fool of yourself is the political argument that you can't convince countries to implement burn or, or uh, for, and Russia is the only country that comes to mind because it, it's the only one that's not covered by the WTO among the important, I mean, I'm gonna leave out North Korea, say, okay, right, so I'm gonna leave out the, but, and, and, and Russia is, is, needs US approval to get into the WTO and so the US has enormous leverage over them uh, at this point. So the political argument fails and the legal argument, I think, fails as well. You can't discriminate against U.S. authors because of the way the U.S. has implemented 18. You have to discriminate against all other four, you know, all foreign authors at that point. And they won't do that, right? So. Isn't, isn't there a more basic problem, though? It's like the U.S. can't, by treaty, oblige itself not to respect the First Amendment. So saying that compliance with the treaty is a reason that this complies with the First Amendment is entirely circular. If there was no common law copyright and the First Amendment had been effect in 1790, then I think they violated the First Amendment with respect to those 12 works that were actually restored. But there wasn't a First Amendment in 1790, so and it doesn't matter whether they violated free speech in 1790 because they could until 1791. I mean, my thought on that would be that, you know, that's what the Eldred Court was addressing, right? That the first, I mean, what, what is permissible, the way those two clauses interact, the 17, you know, was an understanding of, of their power and what the Constitution meant and what they were allowed to do. I can't imagine how the, con the same Congress who passes the 1790 Act and enacts the First, first Amendment is can be found to be violating the intent of the First Amendment. I mean. And no public performance right in 1790 didn't exist. You know, there was a very, very limited publication right in 1790. So even if you could restore copyrights for a very limited publication right, it wouldn't allow you to restore copyrights in the broad set frame of rights that we have now. Uh, I don't think the court would like that. So uh, maybe ask Thomas and, and, and Tyler this. So is there, is there any kind of parallel that you draw between the First Amendment and the kind of encouragement of learning language from the Statute of Anne, which of course was copied without the license to become the 17th? <laughs> you know, is, there, is there some Trump sort of- copyright, they violated 
Absolutely, they did. Um, but they had thrown the crown out, so I guess it was okay. But but no. But seriously, is there a you see a link there at all? Or in term, I mean, the purpose of approach to copyright, in other words, or or am I struggling? I mean, I, I start with the premise that copyright was a natural right and a matter of common law always. Uh, in which case, there was no public domain until the statute of Anne created it. Um, and so something synonymous with free speech rights that would somehow constrain um, a common law right, I don't think so. I mean, the closest that I've seen is, of course, this notion of fair abridgment, which I've seen in some cases before, 1710, and one of the cases that I cite in the brief and that i um, put in this new article of mine. They raised the argument of fair abridgment, essentially, the defendant did. They basically conceded that the plaintiff had a common law copyright, although they didn't actually use that language. Um, but they alleged that they were allowed to do it because fair abridgment had always been allowed. Um, they ended up losing, apparently, or they conceded, right? The court didn't actually reach the issue. But I think that's probably the closest that I've seen uh, in England before 1710. This is a quote from 1878, right? A book belongs to its author but the ideas belong to humankind. Here's the part Charlie will like if you're not familiar with the quote. This is my translation, I may not be, but anyway. If either the right of the writer or the right of the human spirit must be forfeited, <clears throat> it is assuredly, <coughs> assuredly the right of the writer that must be, because public interest is the sole preoccupation and must come before everything else. That's pretty good. If this, Victor, this is the guy who drafted the Berne Convention. Read the, read the oh, oh yes, I'm part. sorry. And one must recognize literary property, but at the same time establish the public domain. So this is 1878. The government's position in this case would be, OK, fine, but it's, that's still a le legitimate government interest, right? And, and if, if once we get into the First Amendment, the government doesn't want to talk about copyright clause limitations, that's still a legitimate government interest. And I'd be interested in responses to that. And, and, Oh, here. So what happens? Will Disney uh, pay a dividend to its shareholder that's a little bigger? Will they make more movies, which then arguably would support the government's point? It may very well be that it's the latter, but I have yet to see a shred of evidence to support it. And if you don't have evidence to support it, how, how high, you know, is a purely hypothetical government interest sufficient to, especially in the face of the First Amendment and the, the Progress Clause, the Copyright Clause? And, and to me, I think you need to have a little bit of evidence if you're going to say, I have a governmental interest. Treaty compliance, yes, but over compliance, no. To me, the reason why uh, we are so imbued with copyright clause and so hard to get over to the First Amendment is that in the past, it's been very hard to see copyright as a First Amendment of infringement. It, it wasn't really until the advent of the internet that that came into focus. I, I was there when Eldred was argued. And I have to say, uh, Larry basically presented the Eldred case to the Supreme Court as a commercial, co as a commerce clause case. Internet was mentioned like once in the argument. And when the, when the word internet was spoken, you could actually feel electricity go through the room. I mean, the power was in the internet, but it was never used in Eldred. Uh, if you think in First Amendment terms, in internet terms, uh, imagine, all right, we're thinking in terms of cyberspace. It's made of bits. And from the user's point of view, we the people using cyberspace, the question is, can we use this bit or not? Right? There's the set of bits. If you, if you try and classify the set into subsets, you have a public domain, nice green bits. You have red bits which are copyright bits where you can figure out who to call and pay. And then you've got this mass of gray bits which aren't public domain and you can't use them. And I mean, it's like the, it's like the detritus of the system and it's, it's huge and it's a, it's a terrible problem. All right, so 
thinking in terms of usable bits in the space as First Amendment liberty. What, what can we do moving out into this space? What can we use? Then you start to have more of a feeling of this public domain as a freedom space and copyright as an infringing space and the infringement taking the form of, well, two forms. One, orphan works, which are just disorganization of the system, and two is bogus litigation threat, which is huge. And so you wind up with a world of contaminated bits. There, at this point, there's no bit that you can't be sued on, basically. And it's like, that's First Amendment. And I think it didn't come into focus, and it won't come into this Supreme Court's focus until they take an internet perspective on what we're talking about. <clears throat> if they see it as a world of, of bits. Uh, you know, that, that trope that copyright doesn't restrict speech because it doesn't restrict ideas is there. And getting them to understand that copyright really is a speech restriction is, I, you know, I mean, I think you have to get them to that point before you're ever going to win the balancing argument. Because if they don't believe that copyright is a real speech restriction, then the balancing is never going to come out in our favor. If there was a belief or people were worried even that this was the case, that it's a natural right, that it is a common law right, and it is perpetual, that when the framers wrote the Constitution and included a copyright clause, it was because they were af very afraid of that and they were very anti-monopoly. And so they didn't want that perpetual right. And so while we can look at the copyright clause as granting authors this protection, which it is in part, but it is very important that it was limited because that monopoly was a speech restriction and that was the biggest concern. It was censorship. It was being used to limit who got to say what and who got to hear what and what information was received and disseminated. So to me, that goes hand in hand, obviously, with everything that ha is in the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment and why you know, the Constitution was written the way it was. We, and those, they seem to fit together very well in that, you know, in that way. So then you really need to look at the, the other part of copyright is, OK, well, to have something to disseminate needs to be created. OK, so do we need an incentive for creation? A lot of stuff that's created online is not created with the desire to make money. And therefore, there is no need for an economic incentive. So we're really talking about a small universe of stuff that, for example, a movie costs $50 million to make. So we need the commercial incentive for that. Um, and for that, maybe, yes, of course, there's a, there's a, a cost to distribute it in theaters, but, but for everything online, is the engine of free expression rhetoric not fundamentally different? Um, nothing much has changed over the course of a couple of hundred years, except a few years ago we got the internet and everything changed, and it, it should lead them to think differently about it. Going back to your debate with Larry about what's, what's going on here, um, I don't know that you weren't disagreeing, but I think that you were both right, but that you were sort of right about different things. Um, so I think that you were absolutely right about the conceptualization of the public domain. And if we went all the way back before, um, before the Crown copyright and the Italian precursor and the French precursor and um, uh, other ways of controlling materials, we could think of it as almost an informational state of nature. Um, where we had an oral tradition and all of those things. And absolutely, at that point, the information flowed and people had this very broad set, set of liberty interests in it. But then we had a bunch of policy decisions by the Crown, the Parliament, et cetera, that was legally organizing how information will flow and was legally organizing the industrial policy around the production and dissemination of copyrighted works. And the 1790 Act actually kind of came in in the middle of that. So that we had a set of legal organization with some, one of the things Congress did was provide a legal, a legal buttress and boundary around a part of the public domain. Um, and that legal structure um, I think is what Larry was describing as what we actually have to talk, we have to talk to the court about that. But that doesn't change the fact that the entire enterprise is premised on um, a more of a state of nature, 
um, information is non-rivalrous, and this is how we organize culture, and this is how we organize science. Um, so I, I think that you were sort of both right, um, but as far as framing the case, we have to think of the legal definition of the public domain and copyright in addition to the, the real definition of copyright, or public domain, sorry. So well, but, but, but Charlie's right that we also have to get through to the court that it's more than, than, than the legal yes, definition. Yes, absolutely. I was starting to think about how recent all of this is. That, I mean, we still had a pretty vibrant public domain under the 1909 Copyright Act. And it's only in the last 35 years that there's really come to be this assault on the public domain that says, you know, that, that's worthless, everything should be under corporate control. And, I mean, it starts with, you know, and I'm beginning to think about how much of a disaster the 1976 Act really was. And it was, I mean, it's based on Byrne, in part, because they wanted to join Byrne. But burn is a very natural, right-based thing and doesn't have all of the balance that Victor Hugo thought it should have or drafted it to have originally, it has perhaps. Less than, yes. Has less than. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's when, but even the 76 Act, you know, what we got, what we got rid of in the 76 Act was the concept of renewals. So that works didn't go into the public domain after a short period of time. And we know that a huge percentage of works went into the public domain after a very short period of time. And only a small number of very valuable works remained under the public domain for a much longer period of time. The 76 Act changes that so we have really, really long terms without that opt-in mechanism that existed with, with renewals. And then the Berne Convention Implementation Act in 89 got rid of the notice function. So even then, you know, if you published without notice, you lost your copyright. Now the original function of that was an opt-in function. You had to claim your copyright in order to get it. Once you say that your copyright vests automatically and you lose it only when you publish, it starts to look like a pointless formality. But when, when the default is switched, it, it, it serves a function of opt-in. Okay, so, and so in 89, we, we get rid of that. In 1992, copyright renewal becomes automatic for older works. And then in 1998, we have, you know, 1994, we have restoration. 1998, we have uh, copyright term extension. And all of this happened within a period of the last 35 years. And people who are growing up in this don't even realize that it was different before 1976. If I had one question to ask the court, it would be, which side are you on? Are you on the side of the copyright holder or are you on the side of the public who enjoys the public domain? And clearly Eldred, they're on the side of the copyright holder and they would never say, oh no, we're only on the side of the copyright holder. They're gonna have to balance and say we're on both sides. But the fact is, they need to get, it needs to get put to them. It needs, they, got, they get away with it. They get, they're able to write completely from the copyright holder's point of view. 